Friends, we meet in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Friends, welcome to this Sunday service and well done for remembering to change your clocks this morning. I wonder if one or two people might turn up in an hour's time. With the change of clocks and indeed the change of weather, this week, it certainly feels like we're entering a new season, doesn't it? And today, we also prepare for a great change in the church's season. This is the final Sunday of ordinary time, all of these months after we went back to green after Easter. But for today, this final Sunday of ordinary time, It's good to remember again together the love of God which is with us in the ordinariness of our everyday life. And so we begin for asking for God's forgiveness and reconciliation in the everyday. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Amen. So my friends, almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life everlasting through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, teach us to be faithful in change and uncertainty, that trusting in your word and obeying your will, we may enter the unfailing joy of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
So friends, may we speak and hear in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So on Wednesday this week, I attended an online conference for young priests. And the main speaker, who is not a Christian, told us that in his opinion, the best strategy for mission is to really emphasize the weirdness of Christianity. Quite liked hearing that. He said that because the strangeness for him might just intrigue people enough to make them to want to find out more. As one other put, person put it, we need to put the odd back into God. Well, today's gospel passage, I think, will certainly put that theory to the test because it's very strange. In these five verses, Matthew jumbles up images of a heavenly battle, a leafy fig tree, and heaven and earth themselves passing away without any explanation whatsoever. What on earth is going on? What is this word that endures? Should we really be expecting Jesus to appear overhead any moment with an army of angels? Well, Whenever I'm faced with a weird passage like this one, I often find it helps to start by putting it in context. That is, unless that context is even weirder, and I'm afraid that this is one of those days. This passage about the Son of Man coming in glory and the, the tender fig tree appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And all three of them place it just before Jesus arrives at Jerusalem. But in Matthew, it plays a very particular role. Matthew's gospel as a whole basically describes Jesus' journey from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. And along the way, Jesus stops five times to teach. These lessons are known as the five discourses in Matthew. In each of these discourses, Matthew gathers together the teachings of Jesus on a particular theme. So the first, which you will all know, is the Sermon on the Mount, where Matthew writes down everything Jesus says about ethics. Well, today's passage about the fig leaf comes at the very centre of the fifth and final discourse. It's the final teaching Jesus gives before the Last Supper, And compared to the Sermon on the Mount, it seems terribly violent. Jesus kicks off by attacking the scribes and the Pharisees for being unjust hypocrites. Do you remember, have you heard before the times that Jesus cries out, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He then laments over Jerusalem for all of the prophets who've been unjustly killed in the city. Then he talks about tearing down the temple in three days. And then he warns his followers that they will need to flee from wars, famines, and natural disasters in the future. The whole thing is full of angst. And in all honesty, I find it very hard to read. But then comes today's short passage where Jesus tells us to look up to heaven where we will see not destruction or suffering, but the glory of God pressing in above a little fig tree, tenderly opening its leaves to the sun, blissfully unaware of the brokenness in the world. And then Jesus makes this ambiguous promise that we've just heard. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Well, what on earth do we make of this? Well, I think that this generation could refer to at least three different groups of people, and I wonder which seems right to you. 
Firstly, when Jesus talks to this generation, he could be talking to his disciples. All of this strange and unsettling language could tell us something about the way that Jesus is feeling at this moment on his journey. Perhaps it reflects the fear and the anxiety which is building as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, where he knows he will face betrayal and the cross. Perhaps the whole passage is inviting us to show compassion to Christ, along with everyone suffering from anxiety today. Secondly, this generation could refer to the early Christians who belonged to Matthew's church. Perhaps you know, in the year 70, the temple of Jerusalem really was destroyed, not by Jesus, of course, but by the Romans. I don't think we can emphasise how terrible this loss would have been for the people of Jerusalem. It really would have felt like the centre of heaven and earth had passed away. And so lots of scholars have argued that Matthew was writing his gospel just after the temple was destroyed, using Jesus' teaching to try and make sense of what had happened, reassuring his church that God really was still with them in the words of Jesus, which he was writing down. Thirdly, of course, this generation could refer to us and to all people who have lived and believed since the resurrection and who are still waiting for Jesus to come again, waiting for the day when history will be fulfilled and made whole. Perhaps Jesus uses this extreme language because he wants us to keep awake over this long period of waiting. He wants us to keep watching for the signs of the kingdom. And in fact, after today's passage, he goes on explicitly to say that we should keep watch carefully, for the kingdom will come like a thief in the night or an unexpected bridegroom. However we interpret this passage, though, I personally think that it is the tenderness of the fig tree which is key for us today. This tenderness, I think, is the fig tree's lesson for us. Because despite the strange and the violent imagery in Matthew's fifth discourse with heaven and earth passing away, this passage isn't ultimately about destruction at all. It is about life. Jesus doesn't say that God will come in wrath like winter stripping the leaves off trees. He says that God will come in glory like summer growth, like sap rising through branches and bursting through their buds into unimagined fruitfulness. Because God's word, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were made, is life. And it is this life which will endure and which rolls down gloriously from heaven to overwhelm the brokenness of the world. This word comes like a doctor fracturing a badly healed bone in order to reset it. It comes like a gardener pruning her tangled fig tree so that it bears healthy fruit again. It comes like the miracle of a newborn child after the pains of labour. This word has come this year in the cries of protesters insisting that black lives matter, in the rebellion against extinction, and this week in the criticism of MPs who have voted to let children go hungry this half term. It has come in the stories of compassion and friendship which emerged during lockdown. And it comes to us today in the lesson of the fig tree, tenderly opening its leaves to the sun, a sign of God's enduring and glorious creativity in the midst of change. This year we felt keenly, haven't we, that worldly structures and daily routines are not as secure as they sometimes seem, but are always liable to change. Chaos has come like a thief in the night and divided us one from another. 
Perhaps at some times this year, we've all looked to the sky, hoping to see a cohort of angels swooping down to rescue us all. But perhaps above all else, Matthew offers us courage today. Because whichever generation you think he's talking to, and however you make sense of the strange language in his fifth discourse, the one thing that remains absolutely obvious is that Matthew clearly believes that all history ultimately belongs to God. I think he is able to face and to describe brokenness head on because he knows the story doesn't end with the cross and with death, but with the resurrection. He knows that nothing is beyond God's power to redeem and to heal. He knows well God's ability to create life in the midst of brokenness. And he knows beyond any doubt that it is not violence or fear or illness, but the tender, compassionate glory of the risen Christ, which will be the, risen, which will be the final word. Amen. So like the tender fig tree opening its leaves to the sun, we open our hearts afresh to God as we affirm our faith in the words of the creed. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And so in the power of that Spirit and in union with Christ, we make our prayer to the Father. Everlasting God, Lord of compassion, we come before you today to express our concerns for the church and for the world and to thank you for your goodness. Creator God, we pray for our world where we see the misery and tragedy brought about by wrong choices. We pray for wisdom and compassion in all negotiations and decisions taken by our world and local leaders and ask that there be humility in leadership and responsibility for right action shared by all. We pray for those who are guiding the nations of the United Kingdom and shaping national policies, particularly particularly with regard to the ongoing Brexit negotiations and also how to handle the resurgence of COVID-19 and the poverty and hardship it is bringing to so many. We bring before you the parts of the world where there is suffering, whether from sickness, war, poverty or famine, and we pray that those most in need will be remembered when difficult decisions have to be made by those in power. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today for your blessing on this congregation, for those worshipping here in church and our friends who will watch the service from home. We look forward to a time when we can all worship together again in this building. We give thanks for Helen, Lyndon, Patrick and Paul for everything they contribute to our lives and we ask for your blessing on our APCM to be held this Thursday. In the diocese we pray for Talbot Village, for their clergy Rupert Higgins Higgins and Diana Newman and for Talbot Village St Mark's Church of England Primary School. They ask us to give thanks for their staff Mandy, Alex and Marion 
who have worked hard keeping in touch with people and to pray for discernment to know how and what they should restart this autumn. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray today for the Church of Wales and the Most Reverend John Davis, Archbishop of Wales and Bishop of Swansea and Brecon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are affected by the coronavirus pandemic. As the number of cases increases once more at home and across the world, we remember those suffering through illness or isolation or anxiety. People who are coming to the end of a period of furlough, unsure of their future employment, and those who have already lost their jobs and are experiencing financial hardship. As various parts of the UK are under new restrictions, we remember those families who have already spent a long time apart and have no idea when they will be able to see each other again. Help us all to be responsible in the things that we do in our lives to prevent the spread of the virus by taking heed of the recommended precautions and avoiding situations which may make things worse. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick and especially people who are suffering as a result of the current situation, people who are in hospital, undergoing treatment or awaiting test results, people starting treatment or being told that their treatment has been delayed, people who are still too scared to seek medical help. We also pray for their families, many of whom are once more unable to make hospital visits or accompany their loved ones to appointments. Give them courage and comfort them in their distress. And in our congregation today, we especially remember June, Philip, Robert, Bill, Dorothy, David, Joan, Joy, Marjorie, Jim, Roger, and Russell, who is a friend of Anne. Merciful God, we also commend into your hands those who have died recently. Receive them now at the end of life's journey into your eternal presence, and may they rest in everlasting peace. And in a moment of silence, let us bring our own prayers before God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, be at our side during the coming week. Help us to welcome one another as we would welcome Christ and to treat everyone we meet with respect, compassion and forgiveness. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. My sisters and my brothers, Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. My friends, the Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Amen. 
It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. From sunrise to sunset, this day is holy, for Christ has risen from the tomb and scattered the darkness of death with light that will not fade. This day, the risen Lord walks with your gathered people, unfolds for us your word, and makes himself known in the breaking of the bread. And though the night will overtake this day, you summon us to live in endless light, the never-ceasing Sabbath of the Lord. And so with choirs of angels and with all the heavenly host, we proclaim your glory and join their unending song of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body, and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, this, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. So united with Christians around the world and through the ages, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. So friends, if there's anyone here for the first time, I should have said an especial welcome to you, but otherwise, when I come to the front of the altar, the stewards, as is now normal, will guide you up one pew at a time to come and receive. As you do, as ever, take your time, let the hand gel rub in, and present your hands only when you're ready to receive. And if you need a gluten-free wafer, please just wave at me. For now. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. God of all grace, your Son Jesus Christ fed the hungry with the bread of his life and the word of his kingdom. Renew us, your people, with your heavenly grace, and in all our weakness, sustain us by your true and living bread, who is alive and reigns now and for ever. Amen. Falls to me to uh, give the notices this week. Um, Lyndon will be sending out the weekly update with, with these notices on, but it is worth drawing your attention just to some of them. First of all, this coming Wednesday um, is our turn for this church to have its prayer day for um, the situation with COVID-19. Um, and each church in the deanery is having a day of prayer. Ours is on Wednesday. It's not too late to sign up for um, a half hour of prayer if you feel able to do that. It doesn't involve going anywhere. Just stay at home and pray for that half hour. Let me know. Just send me an email or phone me if you'd like to do that. I'll add you to the list. 
And then, of course, a Wednesday afternoon, as usual, is our, when the church is open for private prayer. That's from 12 till 4.30. Um, but on the hour, um, every hour that afternoon, between 12 and 4, either Lyndon or myself will just lead five minutes of prayer about that situation. Um, so do feel able to join us for that. And then a bit of information about the, the, what's happening um, some of the Sundays coming up. So next week, next Sunday... Um, in the morning is, is All Saints, as usual. Uh, we are not having um, an All Souls service in the traditional way this year. But what we are doing next Sunday to mark All Souls is between three and five in the afternoon next Sunday. Um, Lyndon and I will be here. The church is open. There will be some very beautiful reflective music playing and there will be an opportunity for you to pop in to the church any time between three and five to light a candle to have a moment of quietness to remember your loved ones um, so please do feel able to use that space uh, the following sunday the 8th is remembrance sunday but the british legion have decided it's just too difficult to have a special service. So we will be having our usual 9.30 service, but um, as part of that, we will incorporate uh, a small part of what would the usual Remembrance Sunday liturgy would be, just a small part of it, and we have a representative from the British Legion coming to that. Otherwise, that is uh, our usual Eucharist. And then I do just want to tell you about the following week, on the 15th of November... This year, we've, we've actually done a lot of funerals, actually not, not relating especially to COVID-19, but we have had a, a lot of funerals this year that Lyndon and myself have taken. And so we are offering a memorial service that afternoon, but we have had to, at the moment, restrict that to those who have lost a loved one in the last 12 months. And we have just sent those invites out. I'm sure you understand this is due to restricted numbers. We can't just open our doors anymore for everyone to come. And we've invited our funeral families to book a place in that service. If, closer to the time, those families have not uh, taken up all those places, then I will, of course, offer that out to anyone in the congregation to come to um, on, a, on a first serve basis if you book in a place. So I will let you know about that. But thank you for understanding that those who have lost someone over the last 12 months, and it's always hard to lose someone, but this last 12 months, it's been particularly complicated to mark that, to have funerals in the way that people would have wanted. So that's how we're having to do that this year. Um, and then don't forget, this week we have House Group Wednesday evening, if you normally come to that, with the APCM on Thursday, which we've asked you to pre-book for, if you wanted to come to that. And we have evening prayer online on Friday at 4.30. All of that is in the weekly update, so if you've forgotten what I said at the beginning, do have a look, it will all be there for you. But I just wanted to flag those things up. So friends, we come to the blessing, that moment where we receive the grace of God which remains with us, unchanging through the week amidst whatever chaos might come our way. And so my dear friends, the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds and bodies in the knowledge and the love of God and the tender glory of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the, in the name, name of, of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.